Yeah, I'm getting motivation. No, I'm kidding. So, <clears throat> yeah. My focus is going to her. So, okay, if you guys zone out, okay, just, just that's where I'm doing. So, okay, so just one quick note. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this prayer for Israel. If, if, you, if you're not on our internal mailing list and want to be, uh, want the schedule of the prayer times, just email us at info at restorationlife.org, info dot restoration life org we'll, we'll send you the link and you can join us in this prayer time we um we're hoping that we have we've been you know we invited our church we've invited our friends from australia our friends from australia are going to lead one of the prayer sessions uh we've invited uh shmuel who's our friend and t- out just outside of tel aviv and bat yam he's going to lead some some of the sessions We've invited our friends in Germany and Africa, so it's going to be quite an international, if everyone comes, we're going to have quite an international attendance on this prayer call. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting uh, what the Lord is doing. And I believe that God's even using the nation of Israel to create an incredible amount of unity in the body of Christ. Uh, it's it's pretty, pretty remarkable to see that. So, okay, so we'll jump back into part two of... We're still answering the question, why pray for Israel? I got three more points, and then I'm going to answer the question, why pray for Israel now? Okay, so number nine, the Lord is using Israel to bring in a massive harvest. Romans 11, 25 says that a partial hardening, I want you to take a note of that word. It's not a full hardening. It's a partial hardening. God has not hardened all of Israel. God has hardened part of Israel. But a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, Paul actually says, trying to understand this is a mystery. It's a mystery to try to understand this. You know, like, okay, God is using Israel by blinding part of her and hardening part of her. God is using Israel to do that, to bring in the full number of the Gentiles and so, you know, some people think, okay, this, this thing, full, fullness of the Gentiles means the full number. In fact, the NIV translates it that way, that when God has brought in the full number of the Gentiles, then God will remove Israel's partial hardening. Other people think, well, the fullness of the Gentiles means spirit fullness or the church coming into the full stature of the measure of Jesus Christ. So, Some people say there's a quantitative dimension and a qualitative dimension. I think both are true. I think what God's saying in the fullness of the Gentiles is that God is going to bring in a a massive harvest through the blinding and the hardening a part of Israel. And God God is using Israel to bring in this massive harvest of the Gentiles to bring the Gentiles into fullness. Number 10 is that Israel, and and I'm actually going to talk next week about how, more in detail next week, about how Israel is being used to bring in a massive harvest. I'll go into more detail next week. Um, Number 10 is Israel's acceptance will bring life from the dead. There's coming a time, I just want you to hear this, Romans 11, verse 15. There's coming a time, God has temporarily rejected, well, he hasn't probably, well, Paul, yeah. God has temporarily rejected Israel or hardened part of Israel temporarily. And Paul says in verse 11, Romans 11, verse 15, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? I want to tell you, I believe this fast or this prayer time, this, this 21 days of prayer for Israel, the Isaiah 62 fast, I have to, there's no way this can be just a random act by some great leader in the body of Christ. This has to be God. There's no way that you could get 5 million people to pray, much less pray for Israel for one hour a day. This tells me, I I really believe wholeheartedly, we are moving into the time of Israel's acceptance. We're moving into the time when God removes the blinders and the hardening from Israel. 
And when he does, Paul says, it will bring life from the dead. Well, what does Paul mean by life from the dead? I believe there's three things he means by that. Number one, I believe that Paul was, was talking or had in his mind Ezekiel's, va- Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. In the charismatic church, which we are a charismatic church, we have been... We have used Ezekiel 36 and 30, Ezekiel 37 often to say to someone, I think it's a valid application, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, to say to someone who's tired or weary or they feel discouraged or whatever, to say, we're going to prophesy life to the dry bones and you're going to come to life. And, I, and listen, I believe that's a valid application and I still do that, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But that prophecy was not to the church. That prophecy was about Israel. In fact, when Ezekiel saw Israel, he saw Israel as a valley of bones in their graves. And he saw, Ezekiel said, he saw, I see the bones coming up out of their graves. And they're coming into the land of Israel. Do you realize that prophecy was fulfilled in the Holocaust? When Hitler's final solution killed six million Jewish people and the survivors of Israel were nothing but skin and bones... That was Ezekiel's vision. They they said, our hope has been cut off. Our hope has perished. And God says, no to Israel. You are coming up out of the graves of the Holocaust, and you're coming up into your own land that I gave to you. I remember it was a very moving experience. I think it was 2002 when Angie and I were in Israel for the first time. And we went to the Yod, or we went to the Holocaust Museum, and we saw this, this stone as you entered the Holocaust Museum, and it had on that stone six million. To remember the six million Jewish people who suffered and, and perished in the Holocaust. That they came out of the graves of what Hitler planned and the Nazi Germany planned. And God brought them in that time of terrible devastation when they said, Our hope is cut off. God brought them out of the graves into the land of Israel. But that's not the full end of the story there. The end of the story is Ezekiel. The Lord said, the Lord said to Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy. This is verse uh, 37, verse 9. Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. That's talking about the great revival that's coming to the nation of Israel. We are living in the days of historic, we're living in the days of historic prophecy being fulfilled. I believe we are, we are moving into the time period when Ezekiel's prophecy of a massive revival in the nation of Israel is going to be fulfilled. We're moving into that day when God says, Israel, is, their acceptance has now come, and it's going to bring life from the dead. Notice, let's turn to Ezekiel 37, verse 11. The Lord told Ezekiel what this prophecy meant. He said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up. Our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. That was their testimony coming up out of the Holocaust. And Ezekiel said, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I have opened up your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. Now, this part hasn't yet been fulfilled. But we're moving into the time period when I believe what Paul said, their acceptance will be life from the dead, that Paul was thinking about this very promise right here, that he says, says, I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life. I believe that's where Paul got Their acceptance will be life from the dead. You will come to life, and I will place you on your own land, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. 
Ezekiel 36 talks about the new covenant. And we, we talked about that in our indwelling life class. Again, that was spoken to Israel. We have just tasted it before the majority of the Jewish people have. But there's coming a time of God's acceptance of the Jewish people when life comes from the dead. So that's the first thing. That it, I, I think when Paul said life from the dead, I think he's talking about a Jewish revival that's going to take place I, in Israel. I believe we're... we're we're, I, I believe with all my heart, this, this prayer time, these 21 days, 5 million intercessors. I can't even, I still can't even get over that. 5 million intercessors praying for the nation of Israel, I believe is going to move God's heart and hand to release that time of Israel acceptance and the greatest revival in history, including the greatest revival in the nation of Israel. When they come to life from the dead by God putting his spirit within them and, a, and they turn to Jesus, their Messiah. The second thing I believe life from the dead is talking about is a worldwide harvest. I'm going to talk about this next week. I believe when God launches a revival in Israel, it will simultaneously bring in the greatest harvest and the greatest outpouring of the Spirit we've ever seen in history, greater than the book of Acts. We're, we're moving into the time when Joel's prophecy of Joel chapter 2, uh, 28, will be fulfilled. I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. It will be an outpouring of the Spirit upon Israel, an outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh, and the greatest harvest in human history is coming. We live in historic prophetic moment. It, it's an... We don't just have to pray for Israel. We get to partner with God in what he's doing. You really, I'm just saying, you don't want to miss this time of prayer. You don't want to miss this. I mean, your life's boring anyway. Why not do something historic and prophetic? I mean, the, the prophet's coming to pass. Heaven's looking down on this going, oh, my goodness, we've waited for this time in history, and you're living in it. You're privileged. You are privileged beyond measure to live in this moment of history. What a moment. What a moment in history we live in when the prophets that have been, that have been delayed for hundreds of years come to pass right before our eyes in the greatest harvest we've ever seen. And I'm going to talk about that next Sunday. And number three, I think when Paul said life from the dead, he was talking also about this end-time revival is going to lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. Life from the dead. Israel is God's chosen servant. Their acceptance means the resurrection of the dead when Jesus comes back. An actual resurrection. You will be resurrected. Amazing. Amazing. Number 11. This is the last point, and then we'll move into the next part. Is Israel's repentance will lead to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, we talk about often here that Jesus Christ is not coming back until his bride is made ready. Vital. Revelation 9, 19, 19 verse 7 and 8 that after the, the tribulation period, the bride has made herself ready. Jesus Christ is not coming back until the bride has made herself ready. But I just want to say this. God wants to add to the bride in greater numbers the Jewish people. I believe with all my heart it would break his heart not to have more of the Jewish people part of his bride grafted back into the rich root of the olive tree. And I believe this end time revival that is about to break out, God is going to do what Paul said, take one new man, Jew and Gentile, because there is no Jew or Gentile in Jesus Christ. And he's going to make the two as one new man, as the bride of Messiah. That day is coming. And the hostility and the animosity and the division that's been between Jew and Gentile is going to come down in Jesus Christ and he is going to have a bride of both Jew and Gentile. The full number of Israel is going to come in. Israel, so the Lord's not coming back until the bride's made ready, but the Lord is also not going to come back until the Jewish people repent and turn back to him. 
I just want you to catch this. In Romans chapter 11, Paul's talking about the mystery of Israel. And he says that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then all Israel is going to be saved. Now Paul quotes that, he, said, he quotes Isaiah 59, 20. The deliverer is going to come from Zion. That's Jesus. And he's going to remove ungodliness from Jacob. Now he quotes Isaiah 59, 20. Now let me read Isaiah 59, 20. A redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob. Let me read this without saying, let me read this another way. A redeemer will come to those who turn from transgression in Jacob. Israel's repentance is a vital part of the second coming. You remember the triumphal entry when, the, when days before the cross, the, the city of Jerusalem was saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then like six days later, they shout, crucify him, crucify him. And the Lord used that moment. And he told the Jewish people, you will not see me again until you do that very same thing. And yet this time you will not shout, crucify me. You will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel's repentance. All Israel, and again, when Paul says all Israel, I don't think he means every single Jewish person. I think he means those who turn from transgression, who repent. But there is coming a significant revival, a historic revival in the nation of Israel, greater than Pentecost, far greater than Pentecost. I think Pentecost only brought in, what, 8,000 Jewish people, or who knows the full number, but it was 8, 10, 15,000, whatever the number is. But a historic one that's going to be far greater than Pentecost is coming that's going to lead Jacob to turn and to repent so that, Jesus, so that Jesus can come back. Even Peter said this. Even Peter said in, in Acts 3, verses 19 and 20, Peter was talking to a Jewish audience. And he said, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come to you from the presence of the Lord. And that may, he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you. Peter knew this also. Peter knew that Jesus, the Messiah, was not going to return until the Jewish people, I don't know the number, I don't know how many, but until the Jewish people repent and return. So what I'm saying now, we live in historic moments. And so I want to move into now, why pray for Israel right now? Okay, why why, out of the clear blue, did God supernaturally, I mean, even listening to, to Mike Bickle, we were part of a, a Zoom call with Mike Bickle on Friday, even listening to his story, he's like, you know, people were thinking that this was some, his, like some encounter, majestic encounter with the Lord, and the Lord commissioned this, and he's like, no, I did this by kind of mistake. I just said, you know, I'm going to go into all the details, but just, he kind of, he called it the Balaam's prophecy or the Balaam's donkey prophecy, where he just said something out of his mouth, and he's like, oh, why did I say that? But anyway, the point is, is that God has miraculously orchestrated this, but okay, Lord, why right now? Why right now? And so before I share that, I want to share the story of Reese Howells, the intercessor, to encourage us and motivate us of what can happen when a company of prayer warriors gathered together around God's pur purpose. And so it was at, right after World War II, when the British, after the Holocaust, the British had created the Balfour Declaration that promised the Jewish people a homeland in the land of Palestine. And because of different, because of the war and a, Britain's economy was in shambles and pressured by Arab oil, they began to turn against the Jewish people. 
And they took the, the Palestine, the British mandate that they had, the land of Palestine, they took that land and they finally said, because of the resistance they were finding from Israel, it became a nightmare for them. They said, okay, we're going to hand over the land of Palestine to the UN. You guys decide. We don't want any more of this. We can't handle this. You guys decide what to do with Israel. So the UN created a committee of about 11 people and they began to research, okay, what are we going to do? And they came up with a solution. We're going to create a Jewish state and an Arab state. And so in 1947, around November in 1947, the, the UN, this, this is another miracle, the UN is the most anti-Israel organization in the world, but the UN actually voted 33 to 13 for Israel to become a nation and in 1947, and Israel became a nation on May 14th, 1948. But as they were trying to, to uh, do the research and trying to gather the votes, it really looked like this partition plan, this Israel statehood was not going to happen. And so what happened was there was a man named Reese Howells. Raise your hand if you've heard of Reese Howells. He was a powerful intercessor during World War II, and he had a college called Swansea Bible College in Wells. And Reese Howells and their team of intercessors, the Lord began to give them a, a real burden uh, for the Jewish people. And I, I just want to read a couple things from his book just to give you an idea of how God began to stir their hearts to stand in the gap for Israel is uh, in 1938, before the world, world War II broke out, Reese Howell said that, I have a great burden for these people, and I want God to lay their burden on me. Are you willing to allow God to lay his burden for Israel on you as an intercessor? The devil, through Hitler and Mussolini, is being used to send them back to their own land. It is the fulfillment of prophecy. It is another sign that this is the closing of the age. This is back in 1938. I am longing to help God's people to return to their land. September the 5th, Reese Howells wrote, in Isaiah's prophecies about the second return of God's people, he says in chapter 11 and 12, that God will draw them from the four corners of the earth. That is just what is happening today. The Holy Spirit is longing to help them through someone. That someone was Reese Howells and his team back then. That someone today is you. It's me. He said, I want God to touch me deeper still with the feelings of what these people are suffering. May God do that with us. September the 7th, Daniel, he wrote, Daniel was able to prevail with God in, in a wonderful way for the return of God's people. After he had seen that the 70 years of captivity were ended, he, listen to this, he said, we must have faith. We must have faith. I want to challenge us as we enter this time of prayer. Let's just not go through the motions. Let's have faith that God is stirring up something incredibly supernatural right now. We must have faith and believe God's covenant. We must believe that God's about to do something historic, because I believe he is. It's not just blind faith. God's about to act. And Reese Howells went on to say, with Abraham, that they are to dwell in their land and not merely have sympathetic feelings for the Jews. God moved Cyrus, the one who had held them in captivity, to supply the money to take them back, and he will do it again if someone will believe him. Do you believe him? Do you believe? I don't want us to believe something that's not true. Do you believe what I just said from Scripture, that the second coming hinges upon the Jews turning. Let's believe that now, and I'm, there's, there's many other factors of the second coming, but putting these all together, we are living in the days that are preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let the words of Reese Howells challenge us. Do you believe? Let's not go through the motions and go, okay, we're going to check it off our list. We're actually partnering with God for the fulfillment of end-time prophecy in this moment. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And will you allow God to stir up faith in you 
that we are, we are like Esther at such a time as this, that we are like Esther that is going to stand in the gap for such a time as this, that God is going to use you. God's going to use me. God's going to use five million intercessors in this time across the, across the nations to do what he did like he did in the days of Reese Howells when he began to pray for the return of the Jewish people. Reese Howells said he's going to do it again if someone will believe him. I firmly believe the times of the Gentiles are drawing to a close and the Jews must be back in their own land when the master returns. God used them as an in in intercessory prayer to give birth to the nation of Israel. We live in a different time where I believe God wants to get, use this intercessors to give birth to the acceptance of Israel, to Ezekiel 37, to the greatest outpouring in Israel's history, to the greatest outpouring in human history of the Spirit, the greatest harvest in human history. We are being called for such a time as this. And so even though World War, World War II distracted that, that Reese Howells and his army of intercessors, after the war, they began to be stirred up again, especially with, especially with the uh, UN vote. And so they, they saw, okay, right when this thing, right when this vote was coming, was about to happen, their team gathered together in fervent prayer for 11 days. They didn't do 21 days, they did 11 days. And they've devoted themselves to prayer and, and crying out to God so that Israel, so that the UN would vote in favor of Israel becoming a nation. And it came back that, and the news came back that it did not look like the partition of Palestine was going to take place. And so they began to cry out to God for this. This is what, he's, this is what um, in, in the intercessory book, Norman Grubb, who wrote the book, said, he said, on the day of voting, November 27, 1947, there was much prayer. But the news came that the partitioning of Palestine had not yet been, had not been carried. In other words, it didn't look like they were going to get the number of votes. The college went back to yet more intense prayer, during which they saw in faith, I love this, God's angels influencing those men in the United Nations Conference in New York to work on behalf of God's chosen, God's people. And they had full assurance of victory. How beautiful is that? With these angels now commissioned into battle through intercessory prayer, God began to work. God began to move behind the scenes. And so that on November 29th, 1947, the UN voted in favor, 33 to 13, that Israel would become a nation. I love, I love what they said, uh, that that. In, in, the, in this book, they, they said that when next day the news came that the United Nations had passed the partitioning of Palestine by 33 votes to 13, and the state of Israel was a fact, the college acclaimed it, Reese Howell's College acclaimed it with rejoicing as one of the greatest days for the Holy Ghost in the history of these 2,000 years. I agree with that. It's one of the greatest miracles in 2,000 years. Just God did it. And to think that he did it through the UN, the most anti-Israel organization in the world. But he did it through prayer. And God is now saying, I'm about to do something again significant in the nation of Israel. I'm going to use my servant Israel again to bring in an incredible last days harvest and outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Will you partner with me in what I am about to do? We are in an Esther moment. In fact, you know, I said, why now? Why is it that, that we're being stirred to pray right now? Well, did you know that Iran is going to have a nuclear bomb? They said in May, maybe in June. But, you know, it, it, in other words, we don't know the exact time frame, but it's imminent. And Israel faces a threat of extinction, you know, of just being wiped away. They want to Iran wants to destroy Israel. And just like Esther, who was in the land of Iran, who was in Persia, and Haman wanted to also exterminate the Jewish people, 
And Mordecai said, you have been, how do you not know that you've been chosen for such a time as this? You need to go before the king and stand before the king and intercede and expose the plot of Haman to the king. And she did. And the Jewish people were saved from annihilation by Haman. Now there's a new enemy in Persia, now called Iran, who will have a nuclear bomb very, very soon. God has called another Esther. This time a five million army of Esthers who are being summoned to stand in the gap at this strategic prophetic moment in human history to say, God, quoting Joel 2.17, spare your people. Spare your people that the nations would not rule over them. Why now? Why now? Is because Israel faces that same threat from Iran and this nuclear bomb. It's a very real threat to wipe out the Jewish nation. They want to wipe out the Jewish nation. Netanyahu has said that Israel will never allow Iran to have a nuclear bomb. So we're headed to a crisis. We're headed to, a, this is an unavoidable crisis. We're heading to this. It's, it's moving without stop. It cannot be stopped. I don't know how it's going to end, but God's calling you as an Esther. God's calling you like a Daniel to intercede in this historic prophetic moment for such a time as this to stand in the gap and to pray for God's covenant purpose, purposes for the nation of Israel. When we were praying uh, on Wednesday about this time of prayer, just trying to go, okay, Lord, what is it? We're, what, what are we, why? What, what is this about? When we were praying, I felt like the Lord quickened to me, Joel 2, 17, that, that God was calling us to cry out. Um, I'm going to read this here. Joel 2, 17, let the priest to minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord. That's what we're being summoned to right now is God, spare your people, O Lord. They face a, a threat that could wipe them out. Spare your people, O God. Do not give your heritage or your inheritance to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? God is calling the body of Christ to cry out for the nation of Israel in this moment as they face this threat. So that came to me in prayer. And then Alice, many of you know Alice, Alice had a vision where she was saw that Israel was being attacked by the enemy and she opened her Bible and the Bible fell. And Alice is very, very prophetic and I really trust everything she gets is her Bible opened coincidentally to Joel chapter 2. And she read Joel chapter 2, 17, and she said, she said this before I, she knew this before I prayed it. She said, I feel like, she thought to herself, God is saying that we are to call, we are to pray that God would spare his people. I believe why now is because Iran has a nuclear bomb that's coming very, very soon. If this, not this month, next month, I don't know exactly when, but it's coming very, very soon. And God is calling us in this moment, in this moment, God is calling us, cry out, cry out, spare your people. The very next verse says in Joel 2 is when they, this, this corporate people, I can't even, I don't even think Joel could have imagined that prophecy would end up being 5 million people around the world connected by the internet and technology. I don't think Joel had, obviously he didn't, know, obviously he didn't know any of that, but he, he prophesied it, 5 million people crying out to God between the porch and the altar, spare your people. The Lord says in 2.18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and have pity on his people. Then and only then. He will not do it randomly. Catch this. He will do it in response to intercessory prayer. 
Well, I thought God would just do it sovereignly. Joel says no. Joel says no. Then God will do it. When? When the people of God, the church, stand in the gap and cry out to God, spare your people. Spare your people. Deliver your people. Just bringing this to a close here. Is in Joel chapter 2, verse 20, after the prayer has happened, after God says, I'm going to be zealous for my land and have pity on my people, after this happens, God says, I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, its vanguard into the eastern sea, its rear guard into the western sea, and its stench will arise, its foul smell will come up, for it has done great things. I do not believe this prophecy has ever been fulfilled. A northern army decimated in the land of Israel from the, from the uh, Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Dead Sea, destroyed on the, on, on the land of Israel into a parched and dry land. God defeats the northern army that comes against Israel. I believe this could very well be an alliance of Turkey, Iran, and Russia that is beginning to form. I believe that God is calling us in our intercessory prayer to cry out saying, God, spare your people. And then when we do, God says, I will destroy this invading army that's soon to come. I believe we will see it. I believe we will see this army come into the nation of Israel. And God will supernaturally defeat this northern army because of the prayers of his people. And then, and what do we know so well in the charismatic church, then Joel says, it will come about after this. After what? After the people have prayed, after God defeats the northern army, after this, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Now, I know this is partially fulfilled at Pentecost, but if you read the context, Joel is saying this will happen before the great and the terrible day of the Lord, which has not yet happened. That's the last three and a half years of this age. And so Joel's saying that this outpouring of the Spirit is going to come in response to the people of God taking their place in the place of intercessory prayer Spare your people and God moves miraculously and God acts and God pours out his spirit. Incredible. What an amazing time. Amazing. I'm going to talk next week about more about this Joel chapter 2 and this army coming in. It's very, very important to understand this. But what an amazing time. My goodness. We are about, you know, they say that history belongs to the intercessor. The church, the body of Christ, is about to make history. Amazing. Just final thoughts here. Did you realize this? Just, just in, um, Amanda mentioned this when we were praying on Wednesday. Do you, do you realize that this 21 days ends on May the 28th, the day of Pentecost. You can't make that. I don't, maybe, they, maybe they knew that. Maybe they, I have no idea. Maybe they planned to listen on the day of Pentecost. I don't know. But God had that in mind, I'm sure. This, this, I, because I believe God's speaking in that. I believe the Lord's speaking in that, that with a sign and a wonder, this 21 days of prayer, this 21 days of prayer and fasting, ending on May the 28th, the day of Pentecost, because I, I believe, I seriously, I believe with all my heart that the end result of this prayer movement, this prayer time, is going to be the fulfillment of Joel 2, 28 to 29, a second Pentecost, that's what Terry Bennett has prophesied, a second Pentecost that will out Pentecost, Pentecost, I be, I'm not saying I know when the exact timing is, but I'm saying this prayer movement is a catalyst for that. 
You can't make that up. This prayer time ends on Pentecost, May the 28th. And halfway through this time of prayer and fasting is May 14th. In fact, that's next Sunday, May 14th, the 75th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation. Now, I know they celebrated, all the calendar stuff can be confusing. I know they celebrated a couple weeks ago because of lunar calendars and all that stuff. But just if you kept the, our calendar, the anniversary would be next Sunday, May the 14th, 75th anniversary of Israel. You just can't make that up. You just can't make these things up. So here's how, here's how I want to end this, is how do we respond? How do we respond? I say the first thing is I want to encourage everyone to get these notes, because you know, a lot of us probably haven't heard a lot of this. Get these notes. Read through them slowly. Read through the scriptures slowly. Read through those scriptures, especially the Old Testament ones. And when they talk about Jerusalem, when they talk about Zion, they talk about Jewish people, don't put yourself in there. Don't think that, okay, God's talking to me. No, God's talking about Israel. Get, think about that. Read it from that perspective. But get God's heart for Israel. Read through these notes slowly. Um, read through, and then so not only that, but also, that I'm, I, I may have not mentioned, but there, I also have a prayer guide that will be in the YouTube link that has a, 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 about seven or ten pages, I can't remember the exact number, seven or so pages, ten pages, of, of scripture verses that talk about how to pray for Israel. And they, they just have verses listed. And, and just begin to read these, these verses. You know, read them and pray them to the Lord. Part of praying for Israel, you know, sometimes people think, well, how do you pray for Israel? I don't know the politics. I'm like, please don't pray for Israel based on their politics. Do you know anything about Israeli politics? It's a total chaos. It's the most complicated thing ever. Don't pray based on their politics. Pray at a higher level based upon God's word. God says, you who remind the Lord. God wants us to remind the Lord based upon his word, based upon what he has said. You who remind the Lord. So pray those scriptures, pray the word of God back to God. That's what God wants probably more than anything. God doesn't need this, this genius insider revelation of their politics and what's going on politically. And I'm not saying there's none of that, but just if you don't know what to pray, just open this prayer guide, read scripture back to God and say, Lord, you said, and then Lord, would you do it? Anyone can pray for Israel. Anyone, anyone can do it. Just pray the scriptures. And then the, the last thing I would say is make a commitment. Make a commitment to join us three to four, three to four times when we pray for Israel each week. I, I, if, if you're listening online, if you're in person, and you're not part of our church, internal church email, just email us at info.restorationlife.org, info.restorationlife.org, and we'll give you the prayer schedule. But we're going we're gonna to connect with, I don't know how many people, you know, who knows, we'll see how many people join. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to pray. And I just want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you not to allow your convenience and your schedule. I want to challenge you to make a sacrifice of time and energy to be these intercessors God is looking for my prayer for us, my heart for us is, God, will, will you help us to be faithful? Will you help us to be faithful to this calling of intercessory prayer as a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah? To stand in the gap for the nation of Israel that God's purposes would be fulfilled. Amen. Amen. You did awesome. Thank you. Thank you for letting me spill on there for however many long I did. So we'll end the uh, online portion now. God bless you. And uh, okay, so uh, Drew, can you come back up and let's let's just stand up for a minute.